Our next presenter is called Laurel Bestock. She's an associate prof uh, of archaeology and the ancient world of Egyptology and astrology at Brown University in Rhode Island. She's currently in uh, California, however. Uh, her research focuses on the material culture of the Nile Valley. Her presentation addresses her experience capturing one of her archaeological sites using VR cameras, projecting them into a yurt, which is a uh, a physical, rounded, kind of tent-like structure, projecting uh, those um, images that she captured in the field, and then continuing her archaeological investigation within the virtual environment that she was able to capture. So um, I'm hoping now that this is going to work. So please join me in welcoming Professor Bestock. Good afternoon. Thank you so much in part for the technical difficulties that kept us from getting started. Somehow appropriate to have technical difficulties with virtually participating in a virtual reality symposium. Um, but I'm really delighted that I'm able to join you, although I wish I could do in person, of course. Um, I'm very appreciative to Richard for the invitation. Uh, my work itself is very much not on the, the technical side, so I, I hope that I can speak to your interests specifically, but what I will be talking about today is a particular application of virtual reality technology that we're really just starting to play with, with relationship to archaeological work that I've been conducting at the site of Bora Nardi in the Sudan. And so what I'd like to do to begin with uh, is to talk to you a little bit about the site itself and the challenges that we face there and the questions that we're trying to answer. And in order to lead you into why virtual reality is useful already in our assessment of the site, but then also what I hope to be able to do in the future using virtual reality. And I'm, I'm very fortunate that I, I sort of accidentally work in a place where we have a, an immersive virtual, virtual reality environment. And it's, in fact, this collaboration had come about entirely accidentally. It was a cocktail party where I met someone who was working on computerized uh, visualization, and um, he let me know about this. And so I, I've been working with him now for about a year. So the site that I'm working on, which I think you can see on the screen, the site of Orinardi in the Sudan, is approximately 4,000 years old. It is a monumental fortress that was built by the Egyptian kings of the Middle Kingdom when they conquered what is now northern Sudan. And there was an entire string of fortresses that were built by these kings. Uh, they were interested in this territory because it's gold bearing, so they, they were opening gold mines in this, this territory and, and then shipping the gold north to Egypt. It was also a transitional zone between Egypt and a more powerful neighbor to the south, uh, the, the growing kingdom of Kush at this time. So they were interested in protecting themselves against uh, military intervention from the south. Um, and then, and, and so they, they built this, this string of fortresses there to, to control also the local population. But the local population really wasn't particularly large. And there's, there's good reason for that. The area within which Oranardi sit uh, anciently was very bad for agriculture. So you see this picture and you can see green fields. That is only possible today because the Egyptians in the 1960s built a dam that dammed up the Nile and flooded the area for, for several hundred kilometers south of that. And all of the fortress zone uh, of ancient Egypt is within this, this territory that was flooded. Um, so that's changed the landscape a lot. Most of the fortresses were lost to flooding, and only two of them survived. Ormardi is one of them. And so the chance to return to this site, which had not been looked at by archaeologists for, for many, many decades because the area was flooded and, and it was assumed to be lost in that. Um, we were really excited to I put this project together with a colleague of mine at the, at the Vienna Academy of Sciences, the Austrian Academy of Sciences. So we started this project in 2012 with an attempt to go back and ask what questions could be asked about the site, the colonial fortress that had previously been investigated. And in fact, the previous excavations, which took place in the 1920s and 30s, so there were three very quick campaigns, had resulted in a, the plan of the fortress being, being drawn that you can see here. Um, and we, we can ask, what's the point of going back to a site that's already been excavated? We can't uh, dig the old deposits. Uh, but it's in fact the architecture itself that is most interesting to me and that provides us with the, the material that is turning out to be so exciting in virtual reality. So what you see here is a plan of the fortress, but it's in many ways an inaccurate plan. This plan uh, was a, is an interpretation on the part of the, early, of the earlier excavators as to what they thought 
the original blueprint of the fortress was intended by the Egyptian kings to look like. And that's important because while that fortress was built with this idea, oh, we're going to go get the gold, we're going to protect this area, the uh, fortress was actually occupied for some 200 years. And so the remodeling of the fortress over time means that what is visible today, and a great deal of this is visible today, you saw that, that uh, aerial image, um, you, can, you can walk down the street of Orinardi, and these walls are in many cases still, uh, this is not just visible, they're still, they're still wall height in some cases. The, the defending walls are in some cases still three to four meters high of, a, of probably original five, five meters. So we know then that this plan is inaccurate. If this, if this is even a proper interpretation of what the first part of the fortress looked like, we know that because people lived there for hundreds of years later, they remodeled it. And, and this is something we can, I love as an archaeologist walking around my own house, even my, my own city, and see, well, here I can see where someone bricked in a window or added on, remodeled, added on a kitchen. Kitchens especially move so differently than people did at the times when, when for instance, my house was built. And so, Looking at how architecture was changed over time is a really important indication of how people changed their use of space. And ultimately, these are the questions that I'm most interested in asking about the site of Orinardi, is how did people reconfigure the space over time, and how does that reflect changes? So that we went from having a, an imposition of a royal project in this place, a colonizing moment, to having over hundreds of years different populations interacting over time. You have local Nubian populations, you have Egyptians who they brought their family, they, they've been living here for generations, are they still Egyptian anymore, are they local? And the architecture is a great way to see that. Whereas the information that came out of the earlier excavations, which results in a single plan that's supposed to represent a single moment in time, really doesn't allow us to see that. So the question then for us initially going into the field was, well, how do we record changes in architecture that allow us to get to this, this issue of use over time? And here you can see an image. Uh, the images that I'm showing you, most of these that I take in myself, I take with kite aerial photography. And people always ask me, oh, our, a lot of archaeologists are, are doing drone photography now. Why don't you take a drone? Working in the Sudan. I don't want to take a drone into the Sudan in the complicated political situation. <laughs> but in fact, we get great wind, and so we're able to take really excellent kite, kite images. Uh, but what you can see in this image is the single kite image that's taken uh, from just about over the middle of the fortress. But you can see on the bottom of your screen where there are thicker walls, the original uh, spaces that were enclosed by those walls were used as the ground fortress. This is where grain was stored. In ancient Egypt, grain is, is necessary here to live on. Again, this is no agriculture can be practiced here. So this is the grain that's sent from Egypt to make the bread and the beer that sustain the soldiers who live here. But grain is also money in the ancient world. And so it's the, the grain here is what is being used to trade with the local population. In the middle of the screen, what you can see, however, are areas that have been that were originally used as housing for, for the garrison, the fortress garrison in here. Um, but what a practice I at least can see is that there are numerous alterations to the original architecture in here. Um, you can see this sometimes even just in looking at a wall. You can see, uh, for instance, uh, in this image, um, I hope you can see that the bricks on top are a different color and a different texture than the bricks on the bottom. And so we can see that they changed brick recipes. And so the, the first part of the wall was built earlier than the second part. They remodeled this and changed the shape of the buildings in line with that. So this is something we can tell is happening at Orinardi. But we have real challenges in terms of how to record that and then, uh, and then explain to, to our audiences who are not able to be with us in the field how we see this and, and how we interpret these changes. So this past season, what we decided to do was focus on one area where we could see a great deal of change and where we thought we were going to be able to make a map that would reflect that change and, and show the phasing in the architecture itself. And so uh, we excavated within what is here, the red square. This is, again, domestic started its life as domestic space and probably became administrative space over the course of the use of the fortress. And the image I show you here is not actually from a single kite photograph. Rather, this is using several kite photographs that have been stitched together uh, using 3D modeling software. We're, we're using a software package called Photoscan that's put out by a company called Agisoft, which is a fairly commonly used in archaeology uh, program that uses photographs 
uh, of a single area taken from multiple perspectives and uses the, the light to, to calculate angles and it builds a mesh model which it then reapplies the photographs on top of. So what we end up with are photorealistic three, three dimensional models of our, our site. Um, and that's useful, it's fun to fly through. We've been using them initially, we were using them primarily to produce maps on top of. So doing what you see here, we, we then uh, export an, an ortho photo from the model. So we're using the model basically to create a plan view of our site, exporting that and then drawing on top of the walls so that we get something that looks rather uh, like this. This is just a, a very schematic model to show you the different phases of the architecture. But when I do the, the detailed drawings, I'm really drawing brick by brick on top of, of that model. So we were already collecting the data to make 3D models on top of in the field. And it was only when I got back to Brown and had this fortunate accident in a, a cocktail party um, where I met a colleague who was, was doing computerized visualization and said, you know, you should bring these models into a, a, a virtual reality environment. And my first thought was, wow, that'll be cool. Um, it'll be fun to, to create a sense of space. I was thinking mostly in terms of outreach originally. And so I think this is the, uh, the, uh, you'll see in a video in a bit, a little bit more of, of where, where we're projecting. Um, so I was thinking, okay, you know, it's so hard to communicate a sense of space with regard to archaeological sites. I can't bring people to the Sudan. So this will be a, a means of outreach that I can use. I didn't initially think of it in terms of research, in fact. So it was, it was really only once we brought these models in, and we brought in a model of particularly this area, um, where we could walk around it in what what is called a ground the yurt. So, Brown has a long history, in fact, of making immersive 3D environments. The first one was made in the 1990s, and it was just a cube with more or less with projectors on the sides and a top projected floor uh, that one could be in. It, it, horrible resolution, everything got lost in the corners. Um, it, was, it was difficult to use, um, but it was at least a, a spur to thinking in the future that had seven cameras. And so when they, when they wrote a grant in the, about six years ago to, to make a new immersive environment, they, they said, let's keep it up by 10. Seven cameras are cool. Let's have, let's have seven uh, uh, projectors, rather. So the yurt is a, is a three-dimensional space with projection on all sides. It's got curved, curved doors and curved sides and a dome ceiling. The, the floor is also its bottom projected with 19 projectors. There are 19 tiles with projection happening from the floor. And these images then are, are knit together in super high resolution, so it's actually sub-retinal accuracy in, in this environment, um, and it, uh, it's large enough space that it allows multiple people to be in there at once. Um, you're, you're all looking from the same perspective, so you can see my graduate student who's done some work on this with me, Mark Lee here is wearing these, these goggles, he's wearing the goggles of power. Mm -hmm. um, only one person is responsible for manipulating the model in this space at this time, but everybody else who's in the model uh, can see, or in the yurt, can see the model from the same perspective at the same time. And so when when Tom and Richard asked me to come and project this model, I said, okay, I'll take I'll take some of the students who are on the team with me and we'll we'll do this. We projected the model of that that area where you've seen that there was made of reuse, and immediately we started walking around the site, uh, much as we did when we were in the field. And so it, it, when when you're actually confronted with this architecture in the field, you saw it. This is you're looking at at dusty, decayed remains of mud brick walls that are sometimes only 20, 30 centimeters high. Uh, and what you're trying to figure out is what their the relationship is, the physical relationship, and how, how that works chronologically. Um, Archaeology is so, so three-dimensional. It's actually a great match for virtual reality in many ways, because you, well, I need to publish using maps that show phases, what I'm actually dealing with, the three-dimensional relationships that have chronological significance. And so in order to figure out those chronological significance is what we do in the field, is walk around and look at every place where two walls meet. Can we see which wall was built first uh, and then draw that on our map? Can we see, oh, that, that hole was cut through that wall, um, but it wasn't originally there, or there was originally a hole there, and then it was bricked in. And the site is huge. So the, the fortress is, is several hundred meters long. Um, it contained, initially, we estimate three to four million bricks. Um, so our ability to go around and report those relationships in the field is actually limited. We can do that for a couple of rooms a season. 
But we cannot do that for the whole fortress. We're only out there for four weeks at a time, and we're living in really primitive conditions. We don't have, we, we can't, we're intense. Um, we have solar panels and, and a generator to charge our computers, but we're really pretty primitive. Um, so the, as soon as we were able to see within New York, when we project the model, we can walk around it and have the same kinds of conversation about phasing that we, we had had in the field. Right? It's funny, when you really do walk around the model and you, if you're in a blank, empty space, you have nothing to trip on, nothing to step over, but you treat the space as though the projected model is in fact there and you find yourself stepping over walls. Uh, you want to take off your boots so you don't mash the bricks. I always make my students take off boots in the field. Um, so but once we, it was immediate when we walked into the York and said, okay, we're going to be able to use this to, to see these relationships in a way that is comparable to what we're able to do in the field. And so that immediately started me talking more to the guys who were working on the, the tech side on the York stuff and said, well, what would actually be even better than that? And these are the tools that we haven't entirely developed yet. But what, what we're working on currently is ways of measuring and marking and even moving things within the models that we're creating. So we now have Agisoft, the Photoscan software, running on a couple of nodes at Brown so that we can create the models at a much higher, higher level and quality than we can just using our laptop in the field. The idea then is to project the model and to create the maps, to create this kind of phasing map inside the model itself. So to be in the yurt and to mark a wall and the relationship between two walls in that virtual space and then export a two-dimensional copy of that, which looks like this map. And so then it's, it's really it's removing a step, if you will, in, in terms of how you make this map. Because the map is going to be drawn eventually uh, once the software is entirely within the model itself. So if we can do this, then I think I become convinced that rather than just a fun, a fun toy, uh, this is in fact a really useful research tool for archaeology. I can see how the, I can use this at Oranardi. At Oranardi, it's particularly relevant because the amount of time I have to spend on site versus the amount of work I need to do is in the architecture as such a discrepancy. But I, I really think that this would be a tool of use to other archaeological projects as well. One issue, of course, needs to be that the yurt is not commonly accessible. Um, and, and in fact, the obsolescence of that technology happens almost overnight, and it's extremely expensive. So I don't think that immersive environments like that, I, I'm sure you know better than I, are going to be the way forward. We need to be able to have this kind of marking and, and seeing ability in headset virtual reality as well for it to become something that is a useful tool to archaeologists more broadly. Uh, but I'm really grateful to the, the yurt uh, environment because it never would have occurred to me um, if I hadn't had that conversation with my students in the architecture that we had walked around in real time and then could do it again back, back in the States. It wouldn't have occurred to me that virtual reality would offer the opportunities for math making and for analysis um, outside of the field as well. I, I do, I know we started late, and so I don't want to take up too much time because I certainly don't want to intrude upon the next speaker's time. Um, but I do think that, that in addition to research uh, and outreach opportunities for archaeology and virtual reality, there are real pedagogical opportunities here as well. Um, and that's again in part because archaeology is such a physical and three dimensional experience. It's very difficult to teach things like how to fade a building in the classroom. And so, I, I eventually would like to work with people not only to use real sites to teach how to phase, but to use uh, to build sites, uh, virtual sites, and, and to subject buildings to different choices on the part of, of people who choose to remodel them, to different environmental factors that affect a building that, that you're we're creating only virtually, and then to be left with the sort of detritus of that at the end, and ask archaeology students to try and re recreate the steps by which we got there. I think that that would actually be a very useful thing um, to bring into the classroom with virtual reality as well. So again, I know I'm, I'm close to the end of my time. I do want to make myself available for questions. I don't know if that's even possible in this virtual um, connection here. But um, I thank you so much for your attention and for the chance to talk about a project that's really a great excitement to me. Thank you, Laura. Right, okay, so that's actually a very good question. The question is why virtual reality and not just walking around on a regular PC? 
and uh, and we do we use the three D models um, as well on regular PC. But the chance to be together, in fact, in the year was one of the things that was so immediately apparent and, and useful, the collaborative nature that we could look at something together, because in fact, that's how phasing conversations happen. It's really difficult to, say, to see how, how this stuff um, relates to, to others. So how, how, how one wall relates to another, how a brick relates to another brick. And so the ability to say, I see this, you see that, and all be in the same space. Also, because it is so three-dimensional uh, itself, um, it, you really lose a lot reducing it to uh, to a two-dimensional screen. That is not how you interact with the stuff in the in the field. And so I need to be able to see um, not just one one plane at a time, but to jump over the wall and see it from the other side.